Well, hello and welcome to another Tyrrell's Classic Workshop. And this time round, uh, amongst all these um, uh, exotic pieces of machinery, we have this, a Triumph TR6. What on earth is going on? Um, really, are there no limits to, um, to what's going on in this workshop? Well, in actual fact, this particular car has a story um, and uh, it has been a part of my life and vice versa for a very long time. Um, it's a 1976 Triumph TR6 PI petrol injection. The backstory is that I've sort of been looking after this car for most of its life with the odd gap in between when it changed owners and then came back into the same family again. I've been looking after this car effectively since 1984. Um, and uh, it's, an old, it's an old friend, this car. Uh, it's owned by my oldest friend, Paul, who is, uh, I've known each other for 50 years and his dad had this car and then it got sold after his dad's passing some years ago and Paul has re-bought the car back when I spotted it on a stand at a classic car show a few years ago. It's, it's, a, it's an old family friend and the car has done 46, 45 or 46,000 genuine documented miles from new. Um, but the outstanding thing about this car is it's, it's virtually all original. Uh, the paintworks had the odd bits here and there, uh, the odd blow-ins just either due to rust or uh, even mirrors being taken off the front wings. Um, it's also the interior is original, the dashboard is original, it's never been touched, the walnut uh, dashboard. The, the seats are original, the carpets are original. It goes on and on and on and on. And Paul is a, uh, a very highly qualified marine engineer, so he actually does a lot of work on the car himself. Uh, he's, um, he's more than capable of doing that. Uh, I've just picked up the car, um, Paul works overseas, so I've just picked up the car to do some work on the fuel injection system. The fuel injection has been rebuilt by um, Carl at Prestige Injection and he deserves a thanks for that some, uh, some years ago. But um, it's in for some adjustments, we'll just get it running absolutely um, in apple pie order. I, I'm not normally that excited about British sports cars of this era, just to put my cards on the table, because I, I'm a mechanical snob. Unless it's got four camshafts, 12 carburettors, blah, 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 uh, it's it sort of, um, I, 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 I love complex machinery. I'm, be, I'm being a bit over the top and a bit mischievous about it, but I love complicated cars and the sort of cars that um, Britain produced in the, the 50s, 60s and 70s were largely not that complicated, which is wonderful. And it worked fantastically um, at the time. And it still works fantastically today because so many people who would not have access to rebuilding a Lamborghini V12, either skill-wise or resources-wise or anything else, actually can work beautifully on restoring their pride and joy, their British sports car. It's not something uh, that I would, I don't have a workshop full of TR6s, but there is this particular car, A, it slipped under the radar because it's of great sentimental value. It's like an old family friend. And B, there is one particular aspect of this car which deserves special mention and certain, um, certain uh, admiration and looking at. So let's just look at that now. Well, the car has come in for a couple of jobs, um, but uh, before I delve into the fuel injection system, um, this is a, 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 an interesting little piece of uh, equipment called an angle drive. And these were um, beloved of British car manufacturers uh, for many years. And uh, it plugs into the side of the transmission, into the side of the manual gearbox. And then the speedometer cable screws into that but because it's covered by the transmission tunnel, um, you can't have the speedo cable coming straight out the gearbox. It would be too tight an arc for the cable to take. So this whizzy little device called an angle drive, um, the speedometer has just stopped working. Honest officer, um, it has actually, but um, we're gonna put a new angle drive on in hope that sorts the, uh, the speedo out. It's much easier to do that than replace either the cable or, heaven forbid, the speedometer itself. So we're gonna put a new angle drive on the gearbox, which requires putting the car on the lift. But what I really wanted to talk about was um, the way this engine is set up. It's got the Lucas 
uh, mechanical injection system. And uh, Lucas had a, a fairly well-deserved reputation, particularly in the States, for being pretty unreliable electrically. In fact, the, the standing joke amongst the, um, the car community in the, in the States then and now is Lucas the Prince of Darkness because they couldn't generate enough, enough electricity to, uh, to light a light bulb or words to that effect. But, um, but Lucas did have um, an absolutely amazing ace up their sleeve for many years and that was the petrol injection system. Um, and it is, it's man car manufacturers and racing car manufacturers, so cars on road and track um, for different reasons, power, outright power on the track and um, smoothness, drivability, exhaust emissions and power on the road um, meant that uh, lots of people in the 1950s were, in particular, were looking at fuel injection systems because they are able to meter the amount of fuel going into the engine being drawn in by each cylinder uh, far more accurately than a, a carburetor, a, a device with fixed settings that had to be all things to all cylinders, basically. Um, so the injection system, people looked at injection systems. Um, Bosch developed one of the very first, um, as I've mentioned two on videos on the BF109 fighters and the, uh, the Daimler-Benz DB600 series engines, uh, aero engines, big inverted V12s with a, a six plunger. They used pistons to, uh, to pump fuel to each cylinder, um, one mounted on each side of the V12. And they were fantastically successful during the war. They developed the system into the Mercedes 300 SL Gullwing road car. That was direct injection into the cylinders, um, <clears throat> and that was out there at the time. But it was very expensive to make. It was heavy um, and, um, yeah, very exotic, really, not, uh, not for um, normal use. Uh, although Mercedes-Benz did end up using it in quite a lot of models. But what happened in the late 60s in particular was that electronic fuel injection started to come in. It kept it, people had had it on the drawing board in the 1950s, but there were two problems. First of all, um, the transistor hadn't been invented until um, I think the 19, late 1950s, early 1960s, and that meant that the, whatever controlled the electronic injection was huge uh, in terms of electronic switching and, and things like current handling and things like that. Um, and secondly, the amount of pressure that the electronic injectors could cope with at the time was very low. It was sort of two bar, 30 PSI maximum. Otherwise they would start um, leaking and weeping and things like that. And it, it was, so many people tried and failed to get fuel injection to work properly. Enter uh, Lucas in the 1950s. I believe this system was actually developed four aero engines during the Second World War, but never actually uh, perfected or implemented. Um, it's well known that uh, the, the British uh, V12 that was used in fighters during the early part of the war, the Merlin, had a problem when you dived, when you suddenly went into the dive and created negative G. That it washed the carburetor out of fuel and the engine cut out. Not exactly what you want when you got an angry pilot in a similar aircraft trying to shoot you out of the sky. but. Um, all that's well documented. Lots of people grappled with the, with the concept of fuel injection to make it work properly. And Lucas pulled an absolute blinder because they went the mechanical route instead of the electronic route. Because the electronic technology was not up to speed yet and able to, um, to actually work properly, um, they didn't want to go the, the great big mechanical plunger pump of the, um, the, the Bosch variety, and they came up with something beautifully, beautifully elegant. And it, it came on to be um, in the late 50s and early 60s and 70s and early 80s to be a world beater. The Lucas petrol injection system. So basically what the system consists of is a, a big high pressure pump originally built by Lucas next to the fuel tank at the back of the car, which pumps fuel under pressure, around about 7.5 bar, which was, um, what's that in PSI? Um, round about 100 and odd pounds per square inch, which is a very high, 
pressure, actually, uh, for the time. As I mentioned, uh, electronic injection systems, you only dream of those sort of pressures. Um, and it came around to this little unit here called the metering head. Um, and then that distributed whatever fuel was necessary and the, 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 that went back via pressure relief valve to the, uh, to the back of the car again, to the fuel tank. First advantage is you don't get fuel vapour lock because the fuel is constantly circulating. If it's resting in a carburettor in the float chamber, it heats up. If, the engine, if you leave the engine parked in hot weather, it heats up and boils the fuel and it's a terrible job to restart the engine again. You don't have any of those problems if it's properly set up because it's always circulating relatively cold fuel from the tank. Um, secondly, it's lightweight because um, there isn't a huge amount of weight in the metering head. Um, Lucas did have problems with their um, pump at the back, the high pressure pump unit at the back, and surprise, surprise, Bosch made a better alternative. So these days there's a lot to be said for actually replacing the pressure pump at the back for a Bosch unit. Um, but the, uh, the fuel comes into the metering unit. It's got a small shuttle inside. It's entirely mechanical, which shuttles back in two. Um, as the throttle opens, the slide on the pump opens and allows more fuel. It's a fiendishly clever little system, um, but it's so elegant because it gives um, fuel via these, these uh, plastic reinforced plastic pipes, gives fuel to each uh, inlet port via its own injector. So six cylinder, beautiful, sweet, six, straight six engine, um, six injectors, uh, and it all works fantastically well when it's set up properly. And the big problem was uh, a lot of people condemned these in period because they didn't have the technical know-how or um, written, written word um, to be able to actually set them up properly. And they just said, ah, oh, this is not working, uh, it's very unreliable, pull it off and we'll put a couple of um, pretty ghastly Stromberg uh, carburettors in its place. Um, and they, uh, that's what they did for the American market. Uh, try and, because of emissions, the Strombergs were considered emission friendly. So uh, they went on for the US market, which reduced power immediately, but it did actually um, help with exhaust emissions on the rare occasions that they were set up properly. Um, so the, the, the PI system got a bit of a bad rep, really, uh, unfairly, but the ace in the hole was how well it did on the racetrack. So um, in the 1950s, late 1950s, they'd perfected the, uh, the Lucas had perfected the PI system and cars equipped with this, Jaguars, um, started to win races massively, uh, even Ferrari. Uh, adopted this system in the 1960s um, and it was so successful and the Cosworth DFV took it over in the late 60s um, that it got to the stage where almost every first, second, second, easy for me to say, and third um, prize winner at a Grand Prix had Lucas fuel injection on it. They obliterated the competition on the Formula One racetrack, on every other um, potential uh, motorsport thing. The, the Lucas fuel injection system reigned supreme from late 60s to early 80s, and even Enzo Ferrari had to use it in the 1960s on his P3 and P4 cars. I'm digging very deep into my memory. The other thing to bear in mind is it's got six um, individual throttle bodies. It's not just one throttle like um, a lot of cars of that time, Mercedes, uh, BMW generally, apart from the M1. Um, this has got six ITBs and individual port injection. This is the stuff that car manufacturers could only dream of in the 1960s and 70s, other car manufacturers. And when it's set up properly, it makes this car go absolutely beautifully. So what I'm going to do is, is um, set up the, the mixture on the fuel injection system. Um, I'm going to take an injector out and we can actually see what an, a sequential jet of fuel injection actually looks like. And then um, I'll take the car on the road, we'll fit the angle drive and see if that sorts out the, um, the, uh, the non-functioning speedometer. And uh, hopefully Paul can have the par car back and continue to enjoy it.
So the heart of this machine is the, this wonderful petrol injection system. Um, and what I'm going to do now is, don't try this at home, but what I'm going to do now is adjust the, the mixture on the fuel injection system, which is critical to it working properly. Um, and this is something that so many people just could not do when, the, when these systems were current. And it was, it was tragic, really, because they sort of condemned something uh, wrongly, really. Um, so you've got three different mixture settings on here. Um, and the one that we are concerning ourselves with is this this bottom one which controls all three so you've got idle cruise and acceleration so I've loosened this bottom lock ring here um, so we will turn that uh, there we go right and what I'm going to do is start the engine I've put these two screws in here so we don't get any vacuum leaks I'm now going to start the engine and actually tune it by listening to how it reacts to the different mixtures. And when these are set up properly, um, you can get just about over 30 miles to the gallon out of them, which for a 1970s um, high performance car is pretty good going really, actually, a uh, two and a half litre car. Um, this is the later engine, the 125 brake horsepower engine. The early ones, earlier ones were 150. Um, but they had to wind back the valve timing on them, the relationship between the inlet and exhaust valve openings and closings um, to just slightly uh, improve emissions to get them uh, through the emissions tests. So I'll start the engine up now. Uh, it's nice and warm um, and uh, I'll adjust the fuel injection uh, and let's see if we can get it running sweetly. Now you can see when these are set up properly what a sweet engine this is. Um, it's got a lovely purr to it and the exhaust note is just beautiful. Um, so what I'm going to do is just uh, um, let it just settle for a few seconds to get fully up to no normal temperature inside um, and then I'm going to adjust the mixture and um, turn this uh, what is already something fabulous into hopefully something running pretty nigh on perfect. Um, there's, uh, there's one tappet on this that's always been noisy. It's not out of adjustment, it's just the way it is. It quietens down after a little while, but it's still pretty sweet. So I'm now going to just unwind this a little bit and let's see if we can Yeah, it's just running a little weak. Um, yeah, it doesn't like that. That's where it was. So I'm just going to lean it off a touch. There's the slightest change in RPM. I mean, I'm talking maybe 20 RPM a minute, something like that. About there is where it's happiest. So I can lock that bottom nut off now. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll just make sure the throttles are all working and opening properly. And then we can give the car a run. That's the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest adjustment. But uh, it makes such a difference. I'll just give the engine a little blip. They're never silky smooth because um, the valve timing is still quite, um, it's still quite uh, sporty, shall we say. Uh, it's not designed to be ultra smooth in this installation, but um, yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. We've just got a bit more steadiness out of it, so we'll see how it goes. So what I'm going to do now is um, I'm going to take this inlet plenum chamber off 
And let's have a look at those lovely individual throttle bodies. Um, it's quite interesting this because uh, British Leyland obviously were um, on a tight budget with this in a lot of ways and one of the areas that suffered was the actual throttle linkage between the pedal or the pedal area, the pedal box which is made up of a series of steel pressings um, and the, the actual cable and the mechanism. So in the likes of, um, for example, a, a BMW M1 with a rather larger budget for the uh, development and engineering, um, you had a much more precise throttle opening system between pedal and, and um, engine, which is a pity because in this it, it actually does suffer a bit for that. So much so that anybody who owns a TR5 uh, or TR6 or 2500 PI or with this engine and this injection system, check your throttle box to make sure, your throttle box, to make sure that um, it's actually opening all the way. I make sure the pedal is actually operating. I've done this before on a Ferrari 456 in another video. Make sure they're operating all the way. So I'm gonna take the plenum chamber off now and we can actually see those lovely six um, ITBs uh, doing their stuff. Very simple, just undo these hose clips here, which are the originals from 1976, as is virtually, well, things like water pumps and alternators and things like that all um, all obviously do deteriorate with age and will have been redone but um, yeah we can pull this off and of course there's always one that decides not to come off there we go There they are. In all their lovely glory. Let me just pull this off as well. You can't really see them because they are a bit carboned, but there they are. Every boy racer's dream, individual throttle bodies. I'm just going to start it up and see how it sounds with these open. That's the um that's the idle air tick over bleed screw here. That sounds nice. <laughs> well, there we go. We'll put the angle drive on and we'll take the car for a run with its freshly tuned and fettled um, injection system. So now we're going to actually just see the spray pattern of the sequential injector and this is um, a precursor of what was to come really because modern electronic uh, fuel injection or certainly up until very recently um, operated in exactly the same way so you have individual throttle bodies and sequential uh, fuel injection which is spread out in a fine mist so that it atomizes as the charge gets sucked in um, at quite high speed into the engine so we'll just start it up Then I will put this cloth there. And you can see the fuel being atomized beautifully as it should be. Fine mist. And there we are. One of the delights of classic cars on a good day is that they have beautiful history files that tell the story. And so is this one. Um, we've got every, uh, virtually every MOT certificate from new, all very carefully itemized. Look at that. 
isn't that just beautiful year on year the varying generations of MOT certificate uh, it's just lovely British uh, motor industry heritage certificate confirming it was originally the stunning magenta color etc and these are beautiful there's a handbook for the Lucas petrol injection how often how many modern cars come with that something like that none consult your late your um, nearest dealer and um, let us plug it in and uh, rectify all the problems with uh, the updated software hardly a comparison really uh, beautiful um, the uh, the wonderful push button radio there we are radio mobile push button models oh um, and there we are it's got uh, it's got um, all the information on there about the purchase of the radio um, there is the original order form and it's the 1st of August 1975 so it's actually a year older than I thought so it's almost 50 years old that car and look at this somebody's gone to all the trouble of carefully preparing all this isn't that absolutely fabulous well here we are on the road and uh, I can feel the difference already in the just the tiniest of adjustments a third of a turn to make the mixture a bit weaker has made a huge difference um, and again this is most uncharacteristic of a British sports car is the uh, it's very refined actually um, I'll just put the overdraft up the overdraft absolutely I'll just put the overdrive on <laughs> Oh dear, don't you love one take driving recordings? Uh, so I'll just remove the overdraft coming up to the corner now. And uh, unfortunately, for the reasons I mentioned earlier, um, the, the throttle linkage isn't quite as satisfying to use as a conventional individual throttle body. You get a real snap as the throttle opens uh, normally with ITBs, such as Weber carburetors or something. Um, it's, uh, it doesn't quite have that sensation with this, but short of re-engineering the whole thing, um, that, would be, uh, that would be a job and a half. But I am going to just, it's, it's, we've got good T's and P's, good temperatures and pressures. Um, let's open it up. Lovely. Yes, nice power curve not the fastest car in the world but that's not the point it just delivers its power effortlessly and smoothly and that straight six makes it we put a mic near the uh, the tailpipe because it's just a sweet noise uh, the exhaust on this that's how they came that's how they were and um, the speedo is still not working because uh, we Marcus put the angle drive on it but um, we, it's actually the cable itself that's gone so that's not unusual, but uh, the angle drive probably needs replacing as well because they, they are a fail. In fact, they go more regularly than the cables do. So we've put that on. We'll get a new cable, fit it. That'll be sorted out. And no hunting at low revs. I mean, this is how tractable this engine is. I'm going to take it just down to idle speed. Okay, so that's doing about 900 RPM. And I'm going to floor the throttle now and see what the throttle response is like. There we go. Can't beat that. It's sort of all, all over by 5,000 RPM, but that's fine. It's got a nice meaty torque curve. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's very nice to drive again. As I keep saying on these classics, the steering is very communicative. Um, it's not like a modern steering system where it's artificially weighted. This has got genuine feel. I, I can, it's like a Porsche 911. You can feel every little bump through it. It's not intrusive, but you do get great feedback from it. And I'm just going to engage the overdrive again, not the overdraft this time, and we'll watch off. Um, I'll put the uh, the overdrive on this side once we're around this corner. 
um, it makes a lovely difference it's a fantastic bit of kit the overdrive was um, before before five-speed gearboxes came into play um, an overdrive unit was actually mostly made by a company called Laycock de Normanville um, rolls off the tongue that one um, and it was actually a, a separate gearbox that bolted on to the gearbox before you had the the prop shaft on the back and um, they worked fabulously well but the problem is they weren't particularly cheap it was much cheaper just to put an extra pair of gears in a in a gearbox uh, but the overdrive I'll do I'll do a video on an overdrive at some time they were fitted on Ferraris uh, lots of different cars and they're just such fun again I'll just flick the switch and there's the revs just dropped 500 for relaxed cruising and that's why these are comparatively economical for a two and a half litre six cylinder engine just disengages again there we go easy as that much easier than changing gear and infinitely more satisfying just flick a switch and again beautiful everything about this car as I um, mentioned before is um, it is excruciatingly original at uh, the dashboard um, the uh, the seats the carpets all the trim um, I think it's had one new soft top in its life uh, most of the paintwork is factory original it's just lovely uh, it's very good underneath because it's always been garaged and it's always been um, driven not in the rain there aren't many TR6s I would want to own, but I have to say, this is one of them. It's just a sweet, sweet ride, as they say, stateside. Um, again, just pulling away from a thousand RPM. No bother at all. That's in fourth gear. Just beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. The quintessential British sports car. Love it. Well, that concludes another Tyrrell's Classic Workshop video. Please uh, remember to subscribe and please like, and we'll be back with something else very soon.